Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm going to be checking out the Runcam Split 2. Now I've already fitted it to the Fury X215 and this is something that you really have to think about these days because you have to have enough room for it to fit on your stack. Now maybe about eight months ago when we were still using ESCs on the arms and of course people still are doing that, it was easier to fit it in the stack but here with the 215 it has been a bit of a challenge and there's some compromises but let me tell you why I picked this model. So I reviewed this model and I really liked it but I didn't like the amount of noise that was coming through to the VTX so I thought well I'll remove it because that will give me then room on the stack for the run cam split and I can use a different VTX here. This is actually the Hawkeye 200 milliwatt VTX. It's quite nice actually because it's got a little pigtail there and it will still fit in the original housing here and I can use an SMA antenna. Anyways, when I removed this VTX it was obvious to me why there was so much noise. So turn it upside down and the RF shielding has been removed. I thought, why would they do that? It's really unusual. And then I realized that the Kakute F4 has got its IMU on a little sponge. And if they kept the RF shielding on there, then that would have interfered with that. I mean, really, they could have just put a couple of O-rings on there, maybe, to lift it up. I don't know, but I hear that they are now shipping this with the Omnibus instead of the Kakute because the Kakute it does produce noise itself I've discovered in this build and there'll be more on that later but yeah I removed the VTX for this one so that I could fit the split in the stack it's also interesting how I have mounted the camera on this one you can see we have the aluminium parts here and actually that's the same width pretty much as the split camera so I didn't need to use the little adapter that comes with the split in fact it wouldn't fit with the adapter on and that does mean that the camera comes out the front a little bit I know people don't like that because they think it's exposed and it could get smashed in a crash but the good thing about it being out here is that you don't get any of the cowling in shot so you get a nice view there just a little bit of the props of course if you want to put it at a extreme angle then you can get the props out of shot as well and that's another thing with the split that you might want to consider is that a lot of models now they have a small frame and yeah you're gonna get props in shot if you don't choose the right frame and model so you might be thinking, well, what are the differences between the V1 and the V2? And there are a fair amount of differences, but actually I found that they are not that useful and the V1 is still a good model to have and it's probably worth looking at because they have discounted it, I imagine, because it's not going to be in stock anymore. But yeah, there have definitely been some compromises to get this thing working and I'm going to reverse engineer it and take it apart and show you how I have connected it. But to take a look at what you get in the box, of course you get the camera, you get the stack, and then you get this shielding here as well, which actually stops the SD card from pinging out, which I actually really liked. So that's something that's different. You had a sort of SIM card style locking mechanism on the V1, which meant it was difficult to get your SD card out of. With this one, it's spring loaded, which I really like. And then we've got a cover that stops it coming out, but you can bend the cover down to take your SD card out so it means that you don't have to go removing anything to get your SD card out. That I like. We've also got a slot on here as well for the Wi-Fi connector so that just goes in there like so and then you can connect it to the app but honestly I didn't use this whatsoever. We've got two buttons on the side there and you can go into the on-screen display and change all of the same settings so yeah I mean it's nice that that's there but I am not going to be using it. Now you might notice 
that I have got the USB connector connected here. And yeah, there's definitely a story behind that. But essentially with this model, and you'll see it when I take apart, is we've got solder pads on it and it's designed to take a higher voltage range. So that is from 5 volts all the way up to 17 volts, so up to a 4S battery you can plug in directly. But I have found that doing that produces noise no matter what the power source. So I just plugged it into a battery and I was getting lines all over the screen. So when I plugged all of this up to the copter, I was getting an extreme amount of noise to the point where it was just too much for me. And yeah, eventually I switched to the USB, which is 5 volt only. So essentially that wasn't too useful having the wide voltage range. Now, I did send it to Runcam and they said, yeah, you need to put a 2000 microfarads capacitor on the battery cable but uh, that's a bit of a pain considering that I just plugged it into a normal battery and got the noise anyways I'm not sure how much that is going to work but I have ordered some capacitors 2000 microfarads that's a big capacitor so yeah noisy through that system and I think that's a problem with run cam split in general I was getting noise with the first version and it's very susceptible to noise and I think that is probably for me the biggest thing that they need to work on with the V3 because well I imagine there is going to be a V3 we've got a different lens on here this is called the RC25G so you get other stuff in the package so you get given this three pin JST connector here and that is if you just want the normal run cam connection on the solder pads but you are going to have to solder that up you get the harness for the USB here you get a mount and you get some different wiring there you get a longer flexible cable if you need to get the camera further away from the board you get the adapter which obviously as I stated I'm not using because it just goes into here you get a load of standoffs which is really great and a load of different screws for different sizes etc so yeah can't complain with that and you get a nice instruction manual with it as well but what I'm gonna do is take all this apart and show you how I have wired it up and found the best solution for this particular copter anyways. So to take this copter apart it's pretty easy we just have four screws here and then the entire top just comes off like so. Now you'll notice that I haven't got any nuts on the standoffs here and that is because it just about fits there and if I put screws on the top then it starts to bend the board and the reason that it's so high up in the stack is they recommend that you put these o-rings underneath here and let me just take this further apart so that you can see because I've put the shielding on so if I just lift this board I'll just take the USB connector out yeah it's a little bit of a tight fit here and yeah it might do me some good if I remove the little connector there we go got more space now so I can unravel it a bit okay so if I just lift this up I've actually used the shielding and that is because as I was saying the Kakute gives off quite a lot of RF noise probably from the built-in regulators and that's where all the lines were coming from before and I was still getting a couple of lines off the regulator so what I did was I actually mounted this upside down which you can do because the SD card here can be taken out no matter what so I mounted it upside down and I used this as RF shielding so this is a little bit of copper here and that actually worked quite well but you can see there we have that little lip and it stops the SD card from coming out but you can just bend it down and then bend it back if you want to get the SD card out which is quite nice so let me take the shielding off and I'll show you how everything is connected so 
like I say, one thing that's good about the Kakute is that it's got a 5 volt regulator built into it and it's rated for 1.5 amps which is enough because the split draws 650 milliamps something like that and then we've got the VTX and also the receiver as well and it just about copes with it I'm not getting any brownouts or anything like that the only thing I will say is that this VTX here it requires 7 volts to produce 200 milliwatt if I put 5 volts through it it produces just 100 milliwatt but that's fine it's enough for me so yeah we've got a sea of wires everywhere but actually the only wires that I've got connected to the split once I take the USB connector out is these here and this is for the control so if you've got a spare UART, which I have on the Kakute, it is UART 6, then you can connect the TX wire to the RX of the UART, and then the RX wire to the TX on the UART, and control the splits, so or like recording and stuff like that, you can set it up on a switch. The only problem I have with that is if you get a failsafe, it could start controlling things that you don't want, so I'm not sure I'm going to be using that feature, to be honest. It's nice that it's there, but yeah, you'd have to really play around with your failsafe settings so that it doesn't sort of stop recording if you get a failsafe or switch off or anything like that, but you can control the Wi-Fi from there, etc. as well. I'm not going to go into that in this video, because, well, it's not that useful, I don't think. Anyways, let me show you how I've got everything connected up here. Because <laughs> there's wires everywhere. So, this is the USB cable here. And I've got that connected here. So, we've got the 5 volt, the video in, and then the ground, and then... If we look at the VTX, which is coming from here, I've got the 5 volt, the ground, and then the video out to the VTX. So, quite simple. And because this is a regulator here, it filters noise as well, but it doesn't get rid of all of the noise. Like I say, very susceptible to noise. I tried various different regulators and all produced very similar results. Same with the V1. As I say, I think that's the biggest thing they need to work on. Very difficult, though, because, you know, HD cameras and all of this, it produces so much noise, RF noise and all sorts. So, yeah, it's really tricky what they're trying to achieve here. So I think, yeah, the results were pretty good considering. But that's how I have got it connected up. And, yeah, not really benefiting from the wide voltage range. This has to be 5 volts through the USB still. It's only the solder pads that can have the wider voltage range. And, yeah, so really not as beneficial. However, I did find flying it, it seemed to me like the latency was better. And I need to give a shout out to RC Shim here because he has gone and done loads of latency testing with this and basically figured out that it's best to set the camera up as NTSC and best to have it recording at 1080p 60 for the lowest latency but like I say I'll link to him in the below because he did proper tests I don't have that kind of equipment okay so here we are looking through the goggles and the first thing you might notice is that I've got the full 16 by 9 image showing on the screen and I didn't realize you could do this but I think you can do it with the V1 as well and if you go into the TV out settings you've got the option of full screen and full screen is actually a 4x3 crop of the full image but if you select the other option you get the full 16x9 image that the camera sees so I prefer that yet you get black lines at the bottom and yeah it's only going to work with 4x3 goggles because it still outputs a 4x3 image you just got the black bars there but you can see I can put my on-screen display where the black bars are and it's not distracting because I'm not looking at that section anyway unless I'm looking at the on-screen display so it's great to see what the full camera sees so you can see at the top there it says no SD card and that is an improvement that used to come up in the middle of the screen before they've moved it to the top right now although that is getting in the way of part of my on-screen display but obviously if I've got an SD card in there it's not a problem and if there was an SD card in there then it would start recording straight away 
you get a red circle in the top corner and then you can use the buttons on the board itself to stop it. So you can also press one of the buttons and it'll take you into the Wi-Fi mode so you have to plug the Wi-Fi dongle in otherwise it'll say not connected but I don't want to do any of that because if you long press I think it's the front button for two beeps you get this menu here and then you can use the other button to go down the options here or the front button to go in and change some of those things so you can change like the resolution obviously I want 1080 60 you can add loop recording or turn auto recording off you can turn wide dynamic range off I don't know why you'd want to do that though and then long press the front button and it'll take you back we've got all sorts of image settings so exposure flipping the image changing the field of view so yeah I want to keep that on wide obviously and long press to go back to the start a little bit fiddly with the buttons I have to say and then if we go into the TV out see where it says full screen there I've got full screen off if you turn it on that'll put you in 4x3 cropped but I'm going to leave it off there so yeah audio out option as well and then TV mode this is where I want to bring it back to RC Shim because he figured out that it's best running in NTSC and recording at 1080p 60 so thanks to him for that I've actually just got it set to PAL here though I did fly it with PAL myself because that is what my setup is for the on-screen display and it was fine so I guess you can format the SD card there and then you can change the power supply frequency, date stamp, volume and all sorts of stuff. So that's plenty for me. That's all I need. And then I think it's a long press of the front button to get back to the main screen. And that is all of the settings that I'm interested in. Okay, so here is some DVR footage taken from my Fat Shark Dominator HD 3s and you'll see that there's still noise there but it's more ESC noise this time rather than there being any noise there from the get-go so I'm definitely gonna try a capacitor on this quadcopter when it turns up but it's more acceptable I could barely fly with it before and that's definitely something that you're gonna need to consider with this camera and I think it's actually probably more suited to smaller models that produce less noise like maybe the 130, 140 size model and I probably am going to switch this out to something like that to try it. As for latency, yeah I don't know if it's because I switched to NTSC but I was just able to fly it normally and I really liked having the full field of view of the camera. That's subjective though of course. Everyone's going to be different. Some people would prefer to have the 4x3 image and that's absolutely fine. Me personally I like to see what the footage is going to come out like with the full aspect ratio. And you can see there my on-screen display just fits nicely in all of these spaces. So on to the HD footage and there isn't much change there from the original. Now I did upload some footage straight to YouTube before this review just to see what it looked like. I was actually surprised to see that in the top right hand corner there were some artifacts like YouTube had compressed it and pointed out something in the video that I couldn't see before and a lot of people commented saying yeah that was a problem with the first one so I don't know sometimes it's at the top of the screen on the top right sometimes it's on the left but yeah it seems that that's there and that's something that probably needs addressing I would say and it's really easy for me to sit here and say oh you need to address this and that you need to make it less noisy but I imagine it's not very easy and I think this is a fantastic product I'm gonna keep supporting it and I'm gonna buy some more because I want to put it in some smaller models of course the other option is to 
take something like a Mobius Mini and put that on the top of your model. It probably weighs about the same. I don't think the quality is quite as good with the Mobius Mini, but you probably have less noise issues and you get to keep the wide dynamic range of your FPV camera. So that's something else to think about. Another thing to think about as well is the amount of jello that is possible with this CMOS camera. So I was finding at the top of the throttle there with the 5 inch model that I was getting a little bit of jello. It has only really appeared on sunny days. Of course, I don't get many of those, so not a problem for me. But yeah, I think again, more suited to the smaller model with less vibrations, you know, having the higher KV motors. So. Yeah, but you can put it in a 5 inch model, I have done that here. Another improvement that I forgot to mention is you can actually power up the board from USB at the same time as it being powered from the solder pads and that is something that wasn't possible with the last one. You had to make sure that it wasn't powered up twice otherwise it would burn up. That has been fixed as well. So yeah, lots of fixes but I think we will hopefully be seeing a version 3 that addresses more things. I don't know how easy it's going to be to make it less susceptible to noise and maybe that's up to me to fix with capacitors and things. Anyways, I'll leave a link in the description if you wish to get one and I'm certainly going to be using them again. So as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.